I'm going to talk to you about the last few years that I've spent really understanding the strategies that low resource job seekers use when they're searching for jobs. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the barriers that they face, the tools they use, and our efforts to design digital tools to support their employability. So before I start off, I, I just want to define what I mean by low resource. Uh, by low resource, we're pretty much um, recruiting from areas that are low socioeconomic status, so low income, low education. And most of our uh, job seekers have limited understanding in, in terms of uh, digital access, or the, the digital literacy is low. So I'll first motivate this work by explaining to you uh, what I mean by employability. So employability is one's capacity to gain and maintain employment, and it's a key contributor to one's career success. In concert, these three dimensions, social and human capital, career identity, and personal adaptability, combine to give us rise and value to employability. And each of these dimensions has their own value, and I'll discuss each next. So social capital refers to those benefits that are inherent in our own social networks. You guys are here at Stanford. You have access to very, just awesome connections. And some of you may have chosen to attend because of uh, the social capital you're, you're able to gain uh, at this university. Uh, human capital is often defined as the acquisition of useful skills and knowledge. So some of you may be here for that reason, too, because you guys just have an amazing program. Um, so these skills and knowledge, uh, they can be used to create economic value for you, for your employers, also for your community. And uh, education and experience have been found to be the strongest uh, predictors of career progression. So when we talk about career identity, um, we're think you want to think about the career experiences and aspirations to address the question of who am I? So when you're growing up, some people may have said, uh, what do you want to you know, do, do? But here we're really asking, who do you want to be? This is a longitudinal thing. This is a long-term process. And so you can express career identity in the form of stories or narratives. And it requires making sense of your past and present and giving direction to your future. So whereas career identity asks the question of who am I or who do I want to be, personal adaptability provides the how to make it happen. So personal adaptability allows one to adapt to the changing demands of the work environment. And individuals who embody personal adaptability have a high propensity to learn and are open to changing environments. So take, for example, these massive open online course learners, or perhaps uh, some of you who may be working you know, full time, going back to school part time. Um, you guys are, are, you know, have, have uh, high, you're high in your personal adaptability. So in essence, employability is maximized when there is strength in all three of these dimensions. And my research investigates how technology supports employability, particularly among low resource job seekers. So I've investigated opportunities for um, new and existing digital employment tools, real time ride sharing systems, massive open online courses, and one of my current students have been looking at people nearby applications. So these are applications like Foursquare. Um, you can even think about Tinder. And he's been investigating how people are um, transitioning to, um, to new careers and how, they, how are they actually leveraging these sites um, for uh, contacts for, for employment. So today, I'll specifically talk about how digital employment tools do, don't, and could support the employability construct. So the ubiquity of disruptive technologies such as robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, really have changed the nature of work and continues to do so. Maintaining employability is crucial. However, there are a vast number of tools and technologies that are already providing us this type of support. For example, there are sites like LinkedIn, Coursera, Udacity, Amazon Mechanical Turk, and Upwork. These sites provide access to human and social capital by providing educational support and access to professional networks, career identity by exposing job seekers to new fields, and also personal adaptability by allowing job seekers to work and experience uh, new fields. So a 2015 Pew report found that 34% of recent job seekers say that online resources were the most important source of support in their most recent job search. This is more than connections with close friends or family. However, those with limited socioeconomic resources are less likely to benefit from these digital resources. 
So this figure shows the proportion of recent job seekers who stated that they were not confident in their ability to perform these six job search related tasks online. And you can see that there is an extreme spike for those who haven't attended college. So examples of some of these job search tasks include um, contacting potential employers through email and filling out job applications. So while the internet is valuable um, to job search, it's still not clear how low resource, job po low, low resource populations are actually benefiting from it. So the nature of work has changed and is changing. And we see a number of tools that are available to support employability for workers. However, we must ensure that low resource job seekers are not being left behind. And this is one of the key motivations for my research. So my team and I have investigated how digital tools and technologies could lead to employment, particularly among low resource job seekers or those with limited education, digital skills, or income. And so I've framed my presentation around addressing the following four research questions. First, what are the barriers and strategies for getting ahead? And in what ways do and can employment tools already support these job seekers? What are the perspectives of external stakeholders such as career counselors and business managers? And finally, how can employment tools be improved to support all stakeholders? So our research has been conducted in southeastern Michigan, primarily in Detroit, and the demographic of our job seekers are representative of the Detroit area, which is shown here. So we have about 78.7% 78, 78 black, 10.2% white, and 7% Hispanic. The poverty rate is 35.7%. The median household is less than $30,000. And in terms of education, 79% um, of the population hold a high school degree or higher, uh, but only 13.8% hold a bachelor's degree or higher. So Michigan's traditional unemployment rate is about 4.7%. So this was calculated in the third quarter of 2016 and the second quarter of 2017. But this number would actually increase to 9.5% if it included marginally attached, discouraged, or part-time workers. And so we refer to job seekers who have been looking for a job in the last six months as opposed to the last month, which is calculated in the traditional unemployment number. We also focused on those job seekers who had a median income of less than 35K and who had less than a four-year degree. So we've used a wide number of recruiting techniques uh, across our various studies. Uh, we've purchased addresses uh, uh, based on zip codes, and we've advertised our studies through snail mail. We've recruited through our community partners and organizations, and we've also posted flyers um, uh, in local community shops like uh, grocery stores, hair salons and barber shops, uh, bus stops, as well as laundromats. And then finally, we recruit through Craigslist. So I'll present several studies today that consist of user-centered design uh, approaches, such as interviews and surveys, but also design sessions, needs validation, and speed dating studies. And we've also conducted a pilot deployment and evaluation. So the vast majority of the research has focused on the perspective of job seekers, as you see here. And then we've, um, cr we've started um, recent work asking the question, asking similar questions with our external stakeholders so that we can get a more comprehensive view. So we first started out by asking the research question, what are the strategies and barriers, the strategies people use to get ahead, and what are some of the barriers that they face in doing so? Uh, we conducted interviews in the summer of 2013 to answer this question. So we conducted a mixed method study consisting of in-depth interviews, participant surveys, and a design scenario exercise. We had a total of 36 participants across all these sessions. We first conducted 25 interviews, and the goal of the interviews, again, was to understand the strategies that people use to get ahead and the barriers to doing so. And we then gave each interviewee a 20 to 30 minute survey, which really was a community and technology assessment survey. We wanted to understand what types of devices people had access to. So I analyzed the interview results to derive five specific scenarios that were representative of the types of uh, barriers our job seekers faced. I also captured aspects of social capital and the resources these populations access to get ahead. For example, people went to libraries and also public assistant programs uh, for resources. 
So we also held a scenario-based design session to understand how groups use their social capital and they use their resources to work through these barriers. And um, we, again, we captured the, these barriers through a scenario, which I present here. So you can imagine that we have five different scenarios. Um, and these scenarios, um, again, uh, tried to capture. These, this isn't a real scenario, but it is capturing all of the barriers and the strategies that our participants faced. So in here, in, in this scenario, we have Sharon, who desires to get an education. By far, all of our participants said, you know, a strategy to getting ahead was to go to school. So Sharon wants to get an education. Um, she uh, took out a loan for her mom, which her mother never paid back. Uh, so now she's facing financial difficulties um, in which she can't secure a loan for school. And so now she's a bit uncertain about her future. Uh, she really wants to go back to school, but she's not sure um, if or how she um, could pursue a degree, if she should pursue an associate's degree or bachelor's degree. And because she's uncertain about these things, she really doubts her ability to, to get ahead. So in this scenario session, you know, we had these, um, we had five scenarios and we had uh, four groups. There was one group who went through two scenarios. So we had four groups in the study. We gave each group a digital recorder and we recorded all conversations and had all sessions transcribed. We designated roles for each group member in our scenario um, session. And we did this because we wanted to include all participants. We wanted every, everyone to be engaged. So here we had a resource, a designated resource person. This person was responsible for capturing internal and external resources used. We had a troubleshooter who was charged with identifying potential barriers to reaching um, solutions to these problems. And then finally, we had a, a scribe who was responsible for noting answers to preset questions and reporting out to the team. So the scribe was the person who kept things going in the session. Um, some questions that the scribe had to make sure were answered in the session included, where should Sharon go to look for these resources? Who should she talk to? Um, who does she contact to learn about these opportunities? And to highlight some of our findings, we saw that strategies to get ahead included getting an education. This came from our surveys, our interviews and surveys, as well as our scenario sessions. Um, our scenario design sessions provided us with examples of how participants felt the need to access support for such resources outside of the city. Um, so many people you know, knew that they had to access uh, resources, they knew that they needed an education, but the question of where would these resources come from came out. And many people said, well, they're not here in Detroit, we have to go outside the city um, for, for access. So I have here um, the notion of social capital, even though people didn't say social capital, they just said that they needed connections to, to others in order to understand how to, how to get ahead. So here um, we had participants call out the fact that you can't just go out and, and get any connection. Connections differ, so it's critical to have the right connections. And so having the right connections was a way to get ahead and not having them was seen as a barrier. So one of our participants described kind of getting the hookup. How many of you guys are familiar with getting a hookup? Do you know what that means? You get hooked up, you go to a, I don't know, you go to a supermarket and someone gives you a discount because they know you're a Stanford grad. That's getting the hookup. Um, so, so some people talked about um, getting this hookup and they said if you're real cool with your, your counselor, they'll send you an email letting you know when the funding is coming back. Others talked about getting the right information. So this participant said that people will tell you these things. You have to have to know, or you have to have a worker that's that good that she's going to tell you. So people, in, in a way, talked about this as, you know, you, you need to be lucky. You have to, you have to be lucky in order to understand which resources are here. So it wasn't seen as networking. People didn't intentionally network. These were things that happened, you know, because they were, they were serendipitous. They happened because uh, they got lucky. So in terms of challenges and barriers to getting ahead, Neighborhood transiency led to neighborhood instability and thus uh, community distrust. So this was the case in both our interviews and our surveys. There are also challenges regarding poor school and college preparation, and some felt that limited work was available, and also that having a police record posed uh, challenges. But I think the key takeaway here is the importance of social capital as a strategy and a barrier to getting ahead. So overall, employment barriers included limited access. This included limited access to social and human capital, job search feedback, and transportation. 
Transportation was a significant barrier to getting ahead, often leading to individuals not making it to interviews, job fairs, or to career services uh, centers. Success strategies included networking and mentorship to navigate those resources that were available, um, as well as to obtain education and training for, for jobs. Um, as a parent in our scenario with Sharon, our participants lacked career identity and personal adaptability, but they were all aware of the benefits of social and human capital. So the key takeaway here is that social capital is in incredibly important. When you have strong social networks, the connections could lead to transportation to work, job search feedback, and information about where to find inexpensive training. So to stress this point even more, I'd like to, to give you an example from a recent interview conducted by one of my PhD students. So in a semi-structured interview with low resource job seekers, my student found that even job seekers with major barriers succeed with social support. So Luke was a landscaper with his boss, but for much of the year, the landscaping business didn't have steady business. Again, I'm coming from Michigan where, you know, it's cold half of the year. So if you're in landscaping, you may not have a steady job. So Luke says, I met my new employer through my boss. He's my boss's best friend. When we had downtime on our company, my boss refers me to whoever. Like I said, I do everything. Everybody tries to keep me busy because I've been homeless. I'm still kind of homeless. Luke had a variety of barriers. Luke was epileptic. He was a prior felon and semi-homeless, yet he was still able to consistently find work through social connections. So to begin to answer the second question, in what ways do and can employment tools address these barriers? We use methods inspired by participatory design. So we conducted a three-step design activity with 20 individuals. We gave participants surveys at the start of our workshop to understand you know, what they knew about the sharing economy because we thought this could be a solution to some of the problems. And then we held a design, uh, a learning and a design activity. So the workshop lasted about three hours and each participant was compensated $30 for their time. So the goal of this session was to answer two questions. Are sharing economy applications feasible for our target population? And could sharing economy meet the employment needs of our target population? We explicitly asked our participants to design a system to meet their employment needs if the sharing economy applications that we presented didn't address them. So we presented four applications. These were Lyft, Airbnb, TaskRabbit, and NeighborGoods because these tools were available or at least somewhat available in the Detroit area. And I encourage you to read the, the paper um, for detail. But we found that there was some promise for the sharing economy uh, in these populations. Uh, we saw that there was, there was general trust between strangers, idling capacity, which means that you know, people had items to trade or, or to borrow. Um, and there was overall belief in the commons. People felt that sharing economy applications could actually be supportive uh, in their community. However, there needs to be critical mass as well as the facilitation of safe financial transactions and clear transparency around, these, around how these systems work, particularly around how ranking and rating works. So our participants didn't really understand how those systems. So recall that we explicitly asked our job seekers, if you could talk to developers of certain applications of the sharing economy, what would you tell them to design, build, create for you based on your, your current situation. And so one of our participants said, an app that can kind of do pre-testing and that can help you with your confidence level, your skill level, interviewing process, something job related like writing and preparing resumes, most commonly asked questions, and how to interview. So we took the barriers and the potential solutions from our formative work to create a set of design concepts, which we tested among low resource job seekers. And so to generate these con concepts, we also drew from HCI literature to understand what tools had already been developed and to understand whether there were additional hardships among job seekers. Upon generating these concepts, we conducted a speed dating study to assess and rank the value of 10 different digital tools. So our goal was to get a sense of you know, how, how our job seekers prioritize these tools. Now the speed dating study, the way we presented it was somewhat of an, like an interview process. We had a list of 10 different tools that we showed individuals and basically asked them to go through the scenarios, which I'll show to you next, and, and rank them and, and talk to us about their rankings. Why did they rank them in that way? 
So after reviewing the literature, uh, we identified uh, job, job seeker barriers uh, such as low wages and homelessness. And from this review, we categorized the challenges as personal challenges, social challenges, and societal challenges. Our literature review highlighted additional barriers such as career identity among homeless populations and uh, also job availability uh, by Hendry and others. Hendry and our own uh, past work reinforced the need for social connections and also uh, Lynn Dombrowski's research highlighted the need for societal level issues such as support for wage theft and employee rights. So the lack of transportation infrastructure was also found and, and we classified that as a societal issue. So just to give you a, a, a quick overview of some of the tools that we developed uh, for personal, we included a concept that we call skills identifier. Skills identifier is a tool that helps job seekers identify and communicate their skills. So our story, storyboards looked like this and, and included simple scenarios that represented um, past HCI lit literature and our own past work. So in this scenario, Andy wants to work in a customer service related job. He's currently in construction, but he was injured in the construction. Um, he was injured on the job and he's looking for uh, different types of work. He learns about skills identifier and he, enters in, and he enters in the system that he's a construction worker who wants to go into customer service. So skills identifier shows Joe the common skills between construction work and customer service. Uh, for example, he finds that problem solving and teamwork skills are common. And this allows him to highlight these skills in his resume so that he can go on and become a, a customer service rep. So we also included a concept called Review Me, a tool that enabled job seekers to receive resume feedback. Note that this tool was classified as both personal and uh, social because it essentially connected job seekers to volunteers who could review their resumes. Finally, we included tools that address societal issues such as the lack of transportation. I won't go into detail here, but due, due to time, um, but do refer to our paper for seven more uh, digital concepts and how they ranked. The key takeaway from this work was that job seekers prefer, preferred those tools that address their personal and most immediate needs. For example, everyone needed support in terms of getting feedback on their resumes or creating their resumes. There, was also job there were also job seekers who were looking for volunteer and community work and needed resources to address issues such as gaps in their resumes. Interestingly, the social applications were ranked, were ranked among the lowest because job seekers were aware that they didn't have many people that could vouch for them. The top rated concept from this study was an application that we called Review Me. And this heavily drew from the results of our earlier studies. So Review Me is a tool for job seekers and volunteers. Um, it allows job seekers to upload their resumes and to receive feedback from these volunteers. So in this study, um, I'll talk to you about uh, how we um, created this tool based on uh, our formative work and what happened. So you can imagine in this tool that users log in. They can log in as either a job seeker or volunteer. And you can choose to either seek resume feedback or provide resume feedback. Uh, the purpose of the tool, again, was to address uh, the feedback, the lack of feedback that we saw from our formative work. But this tool also served as a conduit to networks or people who could provide job seekers with employment feedback. So going back to our employability framework, the tool we described really supports social capital. The tool, in a way, is serving as a conduit between individuals and their social networks. And we wanted to understand the strengths and limitations of this tool and under what factors these limitations exist. We wanted to identify a set of UX design principles that best supported these strengths and limitations. So what did we do? We followed a user-centered design process that consisted of conducting background research to understand the additional stakeholders who were involved in this process. We also talked to job seekers, um, and uh, like you saw in our past studies, we talked to job seekers. But then we found uh, human resource professionals and trainers who worked with low resource job seekers and, and also ex-felons. We conducted surveys, contextual inquiries within an earlier version of our application, so we had an early prototype, and then interviews with our target job seekers. We talked to an HR specialist who had experience uh, working with these job seekers to get their feedback. Finally, we implemented the prototype and made several iterations uh, over the concept based on the results of our initial investigations. 
We deployed our application, and I'll provide the results of the deployment later. Finally, we observed the use of our application through logs, but also in person, um, and reached out to those who had used the tool after four months uh, for an initial evaluation. So to evaluate our pilot, we sent an email to over 300 students, inviting them to participate as volunteers and also job seekers. And we also purchased LinkedIn and Facebook ads. We then recruited offline from local career uh, centers and public libraries. So what do we find here? The feedback from students was overwhelmingly positive. The students loved the resume feedback. They thought it was honest, um, as opposed to getting feedback from your friends. Your friends want to make you feel better. Um, they liked the feedback from the tool. Um, they also preferred expert reviewers, though students really couldn't gauge if the feedback was coming from an expert or not. The thing that the students didn't like um, was that there was wait time, depending on which discipline they came from. So there were some resumes that remained um, unreviewed. Now, how does this compare to our target job seekers? This is really interesting, because um, what we learned um, through going out uh, in, in the real world and, and exploring this was that there was limited access and limited digital liter literacy. So most of our job seekers commented that they didn't have access to digital resumes. Many job seekers from our target population saved their resumes on public computers and eventually lost them due to system upgrades. Others stored their resumes on USB flash drives, but these devices had been lost or stolen. Some individuals had physical copies of their resumes at home. Our registration process required users to confirm their email addresses, and we saw that job seekers searched for their email addresses, and upon finding them, uh, they couldn't remember their passwords. So many used the text-based te text password retrieval to log into their accounts. Finally, our application only accepted PDFs, and one participant didn't understand how to convert his Word document to a PDF file. So we had to walk them through this process. In some cases, we also helped job seekers uh, create resumes because they had lost them. So we, we did a lot of uh, hand-holding. So I think what's most alarming about these findings is that, is that these same population segments are likely unable to submit basic employment applications uh, or unemployment applications to or, or file for unemployment uh, without significant handholding. These populations likely face other barriers such as signing up for health care or conducting searches um, for inexpensive housing. So we consider and we contributed the following design principles as a start to address some of the issues we encountered in our deployment. Compatibility, practicality, direct support, and familiarity and accessibility. Compatibility, many job seekers didn't have digital copies of their resumes, though several had physical copies. For compatibility, we propose allowing job seekers to upload a photographed image of their resume as smartphones uh, with cameras were pervasive among our job seekers. Practicality. Some job seekers had a limited understanding of how to keep track of digital files. Job seekers kept digital copies of their resumes on thumb drives, but these devices were either lost or, so or stolen. So we proposed ways to accept resumes offline through a kiosk of some sort. And we propose that these kiosks be available in accessible locations uh, because, again, transportation is an issue. Direct support. Some patrons required hand-holding. So we, we suggest built-in chat support with experts. And we're currently seeing these in, in the tools that some of these job seekers are using. Finally, familiarity and accessibility. Though we followed a standard interface for user registration, individuals forgot passwords to accounts such as email, and we suggest allowing participants to register with familiar accounts such as Facebook and Instagram, but also SMS verification or with two-step verification phone prompts. Overall, again, the tool worked great for our students, but failed miserably among our low-resource job seekers, primarily due to low digital literacy. Overall, low digital literacy is a significant barrier to employment for our, target job, our targeted job users. And these, seek, and these job seekers will continue to be left behind without substantial change. So in this work, we contributed ReviewMe, which is a digital employment tool inspired by participatory and user-centered design techniques. The tool aims to address the social network gaps that exist in the employment process 
and particularly among these populations. So we extend past employment research that aims to address employment needs among low resource job seekers. The system currently has limitations. We had to recruit volunteers who provided feedback free of charge, which is not sustainable over the long term. So going forward, we plan to automate resume feedback using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. We plan to adhere to our own design principles. Um, and uh, we want to aim for a wider scale deployment across career centers. We're also exploring other types of feedback tools, such as uh, interview feedback. So in the next um, set of studies, we, we wanted to get kind of a, a comprehensive perspective of um, the job process. So we're, we're trying to understand from career counselors and business managers what challenges that do they see uh, that job seekers face. So we conducted 23 interviews so far with career advisors, business service coordinators, and one employer. So career advisors are those who help job seekers find employment. Business service representatives are those who work directly with the company recruiters, and they also work with uh, human resources. Employers are, of course, those who hire our job seekers. So our initial results reveal that transportation remains an open challenge. And our low, um, and, and our, um, yes, so transportation remains an open challenge. Um, but we see that opportunities exist for digital employment tools to support human capital, career identity, and personal adaptability. Social capital was not salient among our um, external stakeholders. And we think this is um, because that they actually serve as social capital, so they wouldn't necessarily see that as a barrier. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data um, from employers to put together a complete picture, um, but this is, this is work that uh, continues to go on. So on the next slides, I'll provide quotes from our stakeholders to demonstrate some of our findings. So over half of our career advisors and business service reps talked about the importance of having soft skills. In the current job market, employers were actually willing to train job seekers on how to do the hard skills. As one career advisor stated, I think the number one thing is learning how to articulate the skills that they, the job seekers, have. And to match those soft skills to relatable words is one of the biggest struggles that we have. Because if you can do that, you can write your resume, you can write your cover letter, and that leads into everything else, which corresponds to our prior findings as well. So in some cases, we saw that job seekers weren't able to write their resumes. So this was a challenge. Recall that job seekers spoke broadly about the need for education and training, but not soft skills specifically. As a reminder, career identity relates to one's experiences and aspirations, and it addresses the question of, who am I? Or who do I want to be? Career identity could be expressed in the form of stories or narratives. And one career advisor explained that there aren't tools available to support this, dimensions of, this dimension of employability. He says, I don't try to come up with job titles for them. It's really based on what they say. We don't have the tools for us to sit down and say, oh, you sound like you, you would be a marketing engineer or whatever. That kind of goes a little beyond our scope. Another career advisor stressed the longitudinal nature of career identity. He said, long-term employment comes from not only meeting your basic needs, but also feeling fulfilled in what you do. So really getting to know someone helps to figure out what opportunities would be best for them. What's interesting is that career identity was not a barrier or strategy identified by our job seekers. So personal adaptability allows one to adapt to the changing demands of work environment and the job market. This was another dimension that was salient among career advisors, but hadn't been mentioned previously by our job seekers. So here, the career advisor calls out how job seekers aren't quite sure how or what steps they need to reach their career identity. He says, because everybody get caught up. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a doctor. I want to be this. I want to be that. But then when you ask them, but where do you see yourself five years from now? I don't know. So now that we've heard the perspectives of external stakeholders, I'd like, I'd like to compare these perspectives to job seekers. So first and foremost, in terms of challenges, limited access to transporta transportation is a severe barrier for our job seekers. Low digital literacy is also a significant barrier that we identified in our deployment. 
We also found in my PhD student study that digital tools such as Indeed were excellent for finding jobs, but not necessarily for landing them. So what we did find from my students' uh, study was that social capital was key despite the barriers that job seekers faced. And for external stakeholders, transportation again showed up as a key barrier, and social capital and low digital literacy was a challenge among job seekers, but this wasn't mentioned among our external stakeholders. In terms of keys to success, again, job seekers saw, saw social capital. Both job seekers and external stakeholders mentioned human capital, though job seekers were more set on the hard skills, and external stakeholders felt that soft skills were the key. Finally, personal adaptability wasn't mentioned from the perspective of job seekers, though this was a success factor among our external stakeholders. So we see this as an opportunity to support both parties. So the last step in our work has been to understand how employment tools can be improved to support all stakeholders, and we aim to do this with a tool that we are calling Dream Gigs. So Dream Gigs is a tool that helps job seekers understand what career-related skills they'll need to reach their ideal or their dream gig or their dream job. Our goal for Dream Gigs is to support all dimensions of employability, and I'll discuss how after providing a walkthrough of the tool. <clears throat> so this tool allows users to provide their current or their most recent job, let's say construction laborers. Users then enter their dream job or the job that they would like to obtain, let's say accountant. Finally, participants can enter their geographic location, let's say Detroit. So this step requires one to, to consider who do you want to be? We then tap into the Data at Work API, which I can discuss later if there's time, but the API allows us to take the skills that you would have as a construction laborer and then take the skills that you would need as an accountant. And we, we take the difference, like what is it that you actually need in order to become an accountant that you don't have? So once we have that, we present the users with the skills that they need to acquire in order to reach their dream job. So here, users select economics and accounting and mathematical reason, reasoning. Because this step requires, um, provides the skills need, needed to reach the selected dream, go, dream job, we characterize this step as human capital. We then take these skills, economics and accounting, and input each back into the Data at Work API. This provides us with a list of jobs that job seekers could do in order to obtain these skills. And this is what you see here. So you can think about this as the skills acquisition step. So users can see a list of related jobs that they could do, and we also allow users to select one of these related occupations to see what jobs actually is, exist in their area. So for example, someone could select correspondent clerks. Recall that personal adaptability allows one to adapt to the changing demands of the work environment in the job market. This list of related jobs shows job seekers which jobs that they could consider to reach their dream job. Finally, after selecting one of the related jobs, users are able to see if this job or related jobs are available in their area. We're, here we're pulling available jobs through Indeed, but we've also considered pulling jobs from Craigslist because those are more gig-like. We've also considered um, pulling um, skills or, or classes that are available um, through MOOCs, but I'll tell you later why we're not doing that right now. So for job seekers, we've been prioritizing opportunities to bring them face to face with other individuals to build social and human capital. So we've decided not at this point to, to pull in um, uh, courses for massive open online, for, to pull in MOOCs or to pull in YouTube videos that could help with these skills. We, we, you know, as a side thing, we're looking at ways that people could learn as a group. Again, our research is telling us that social capital is really important. So we, we don't really want our job seekers to um, work in isolation. We're also uh, looking at uh, volunteer opportunities. Actually, this is what you see here. So they can um, not only get the, the jobs from Indeed, but they can uh, seek volunteer opportunities. Now, some of you may be wondering, you know, hey, Tawana, you just mentioned that digital literacy is a significant barrier. Why are you proposing this tool? Well, first, 
There wasn't a login screen. Uh, there is nothing that needs to be up, up, uploaded. So job seekers can really use this as a fully informational tool. So our, our goal also was to make this an inclusive tool. So we're not um, we're not just you know designing for a mobile phone. We're designing for uh, desktop applications as well. And what we're really advocating for this tool is not just designing for the job seeker, but we're advocating that we design for intermediaries as well. So we think that we could bring in job seekers who may have you know, some level of digital literacy as well as job seekers who you know, may need support from the intermediaries. We believe that the intermediaries can bridge the gaps that we're seeing in digital literacy. We also know from our interviews with, with these um, external stakeholders, the career counselors, that they're able to connect job seekers to resources such as mentors, uh, transportation, and also education. We also know from our external stakeholders that they could provide referrals. So to summarize our findings and conclude the talk, we find that job seekers' barriers and strategies, um, barriers to getting ahead and strategies to getting ahead include accessing social resources, getting feedback on their job search, education and training, and also transportation. We saw how employment tools can address these barriers, but that digital literacy was a barrier. So we contributed these four design principles for designers to adhere to. Compatibility, practicality, direct support, and familiarity and accessibility. We also raised the question of external stakeholder perspectives. We found here that career advisors and business services representatives, their key challenges and strategies for success included building human capital, particularly soft skills, translating skills for a career identity, and getting job seekers to consider long-term employment and not just the short term, which is related to one's personal adaptability. Finally, as an example of how employment tools can be improved to support all stakeholders, we propose building tools like Dream Gigs, tools that support social and human capital, career identity, and personal adaptability, or all dimensions of employability. I'll say that while social capital and access to social networks by far is a key challenge for our job seekers, transportation is a serious barrier. I just want to call out that we did investigate this further. Um, in fact, this barrier drove our investigation into ways in which transportation could broadly support em employment, actually getting to work, to job interviews, to career counselors. So in a study that we conducted, we onboarded individuals to Uber, and uh, we did face challenges such as digital literacy, which I, I encourage you to read the paper. Um, but for those individuals who were able to be onboarded, we were able to do so successfully from the support of our intermediaries, such as job training centers and community organizations. So after working through the challenges, we found that real-time ride-sharing systems are an excellent solution for low-resource job seekers. Um, but we do need to lower the cost of such services um, because you know, that is a barrier. But once we get through that, we think it could be a solution. In fact, in a follow-on study to this, uh, what we found was that passengers, um, the, the passengers in the Uber ride actually received emotional support from their drivers. Um, they were told to not give up the job search. They were told about local jobs that were available. Um, so we saw this as an opportunity for people to um, build social capital or to develop social capital. So the key takeaways in the talk are that social capital is vital. We need to leverage technology to, to engage low resource job seekers with available social resources offline. Connecting to intermediaries may actually be key in addressing issues of digital literacy. And then employability is a long term, not a one time endeavor. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank my research team and collaborators. And I'd also like to thank our funders, NSF, University of Michigan's Ford uh, School of Public Policy, and also U of M's uh, Poverty Solutions. And um, I'll take your questions.